Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for being here at Mega Conference. Uh, it's always a great time to get together with fellow bankers and, and learn what's, what's happening in our industry. Uh, so, again, thank you for being here. My name is Rob Robinson. I'm the community president of Simmons Bank in El Dorado, and I'm a senior credit officer for Simmons as well. And I'm your uh, Arkansas Bankers Association chairman for the year. Um, again, thank you for being here. Hope you're enjoying your lunch. Please continue. Um, uh, we're going to start the panel, but I think uh, he's not, no one's going to mind if y'all keep eating while you do it. Uh, uh, and so we're going to move, keep moving, because I know we've got some, this afternoon we've got a lot of things going on. want to get y'all out of here on time. Uh, with, uh, with, without further ado, I want to introduce the moderator of our hemp banking panel today, Kevin Hart. And it's not the comedian. Uh, in fact, it's my, stand up, Mike. It's about the, the exact uh, antithesis of Kevin Hart. He's short, I'm tall. He's in shape, I'm not. Keep going. He'll, he'll figure it out. And I'm, I'm sure he'll sprinkle in a few Kevin Hart references uh, uh, as he uh, leads the panel today. Kevin is the CEO of Green Check Verified. Since 2015, he has focused on solving one of the biggest problems in the cannabis industry, cannabis. He formed a team of uh, former federal examiners, BSA, AML, compliance experts, and technologists to tackle these unique banking challenges. The team then developed a solution for banking cannabis that is purpose-built to work within the banking system and not around it. The Green Check platform was formally launched in January 2019 and is now running compliance programs in multiple states and growing. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that today. Mr. Hart is joined by two panelists, Daniel Beck, Vice President and General Counsel for Simmons Bank, and Dan Martini, Vice President, President of Congressional Relations and Political Affairs for the American Bankers Association. Uh, Dan, thanks for making it all the way down from D.C., and uh, I hope you found it cooler than when you left it. Uh, uh, we're really looking forward to the, to the dis discussion today, so please help me welcome the hemp panel. So good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Kevin Hart. Uh, I already got a great warm introduction, so you don't need any more infomercial about uh, us. Uh, I will just say that uh, Green Check is active and live uh, in, in or a Woodstock moment uh, in nine different states right now, including large publicly traded financial institutions. Uh, again, we're purpose built to work within the banking industry for banking cannabis uh, programs. So there are guidelines from FinCEN, et cetera, as to how to do it. The questions of can, how, and why should I are always on top of mind for everybody in the banking industry. Uh, so that is what we set out to do. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, moderate this panel. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting these two gentlemen over the phone, so it's great to be able to shake their hands in person today. Uh, I'm going to let them each introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into the program. So Daniel? All right. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Beck. I'm senior counsel with Simmons Bank. I've worked in Little Rock for about 11 years now. I practice uh, in private practice before joining Simmons a little more than a year ago. Uh, I know a lot of you, uh, some of you new faces, but I'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, Dan Martini with the American Bankers Association. I've been with ABA for about two years now, and I just wanted to thank you all for having me down here today. Uh, the weather is much nicer, so I appreciate that. Um, I am one of the uh, six or seven congressional relations folks that are the face of ABA uh, uh, through the halls of Congress. Uh, so uh, my job is possible because of your support. So thank you very much, and looking forward to today's discussion. So the you know the outline of the program. I'm not we're, as you notice, we don't have powerpoints. We don't have uh, pitch decks up here. We're here to talk, have questions, have conversations. And we're hoping that we'll, we will get a lot of questions uh, at the tail end of this. But we're, the agenda is we're really going to uh, tackle this from the federal level. What's going on with the farm bill? What's the difference between hemp, cannabis, CBD, THC? Some of those questions you need to be understand. And then really what's going on here at, on the ground in Arkansas? So starting at the top of the funnel and kind of drill down, 
hopefully we'll be able to uh, address some high level questions and concerns. We're gonna sprinkle in some uh, heavy detail uh, as part of this, but since the 2018 passage of the hemp farm bill, um, from my seat and from what we see on a nationwide basis, uh, it candidly has done nothing but cause a lot of confusion, uh, a, a massive amount of confusion. So much so, and I, I was talking uh, a moment ago to Rob, one of the interesting things is that we've actually seen people who were, we call them can of curious, people who are on the sideline trying to figure out how to enter this, into this industry. They actually have moved away from hemp and actually have gone more towards pure marijuana banking. Highly regulated, easier to monitor. Not regulated, hemp, from a banking perspective, harder to monitor. And then recently with the, uh, the House action, when they voted on the Safe Banking Act, you know, that popped up a whole new wave of questions and different approaches and ideas. So again, starting at the top, we're gonna talk about, you know, the recent action that's gone on in Washington where a Safe Banking Act seems to be getting, getting momentum, certainly in the House. Uh, we'll kick around what our opinions are and what we hear. Uh, what's happening uh, on the Senate, what the outcome of that looks like, and then we'll move through the platform. So, you know, Dan, you just uh, flew in from Washington. I'm sure the ticker tapes were running hot, hot and heavy yesterday. So what's your, what's your take on where we are with Safe Banking Act and what does your crystal ball look like? Sure, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so as some of you may know, the Safe Banking Act passed the House uh, with broad bipartisan support about two weeks ago now. Uh, the final vote was 321 to 103, including 91 Republicans. Uh, Congressman Hill and Congressman Womack from the delegation also supported passage. Uh, so that's a, a huge step. That's the first major vote on cannabis-related uh, policy we've seen in the, in the House or, or in Congress as a whole. So now it's kicked over to the Senate. So where does that leave uh, this piece of legislation? Well, Senator Crapo, chairman of the Banking Committee, has recently stated that he intends to take up something on cannabis banking uh, this fall. What that something may be uh, is likely a variation on the Safe Banking Act. So Senator Gardner from Colorado has his own version of the bill along with uh, Senator Warren. Um, I believe that is where the Banking Committee is going to start. Uh, in addition to some of the issues covered in the Safe Banking Act, um, along with uh, uh, the hemp provision and um, operation choke point, anti-operation choke point uh, language, uh, Senator Crapo has indicated his concerns on legacy cash, uh, how to do deal with interstate banking, and also some of the potency issues between uh, hemp and uh, hot hemp or, or THC, or hemp with higher levels of THC. So I think what we'll see, uh, from my opinion and from what I've heard, is uh, probably a hearing towards the end of this month on the issue, and then potentially a markup, um, which would be the first markup in over a year in the Senate Banking Committee, uh, likely around the uh, November uh, Thanksgiving timeline. That said, uh, a lot of things are going on in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, so the entire process could be derailed by some of the events of the day, and uh, it's seemingly uh, a new issue week by week. So cautiously optimistic, we get something. Uh, in, through the Senate this fall, but uh, again, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, well, I think it's good to just kind of clarify what the issues are uh, in relation to hemp. You know, one, hemp is different from marijuana, obviously. Um, after the 2018 Farm Bill, hemp was taken out of the Controlled Substance Act, so it's not illegal. Um, they're waiting on federal regulations to come up, and so uh, there's still a lot of hemp going around. So what does that mean? Well, in 2014, there was, an, there was a bill that allowed pilot programs in several different states. Arkansas, including some of the states around Arkansas and others, adopted the pilot programs. And those pilot programs said that you, on a limited basis, you could start research, including research with marketing. So um, uh, this is run through the, the, the plant board in Arkansas. So over the summer, there have been people in Arkansas who are licensed who get to grow and sell hemp. Um, a lot of times they'll sell the different pieces of the hemp to uh, producers. Those producers can manufacture the different hemp, et cetera. There are different pieces of the hemp plant, you know, flowers and seeds that are gonna be regulated tightly, and then other things that are not gonna be as regulated. 
So if you came across somebody selling a hemp t-shirt, that doesn't necessarily mean that they needed a license to sell a hemp t-shirt. Um, if you're going to be uh, making a loan to somebody who grows hemp, well, you've got a different set of issues. And so at the federal level, one, with the Safe Banking Act, I think they're trying to make uh, bankers understand that yes, hemp in fact is different from marijuana and it is legal uh, and they're trying to push uh, new regulations or at least get the regulators to give some guidance to banks about this is the best course of action when you have a hemp customer and this is different from the FinCEN guidance related to marijuana, it is a totally separate issue. Um, and in the most recent uh, farm bill that I think you had brought up, um, uh, there's an issue with CBD uh, that's derived from hemp um, that uh, the, we're having issues with, or not we, but people who are trying to sell CBD products are having issues with. So um, the main issue is when can CBD, which is a derivative of hemp, can be sold. If you went to Kroger today, you'd find, or Dillard's or other places, you'd find a CBD area that's legal because of the FDA um, is not regulating something like a lotion. But if you see, you know, the best new improved uh, CBD candy bar, well, you, you might want to watch out. Um, <coughs> so uh, uh, the, uh, trying to get clarification on that, but um, for banking purposes, if you're going to have hemp customers, it's about what's the appropriate risk and understanding what the risk is and how to handle it. You know, one of the things that um, the lack of clarity that, uh, that we see and we hear, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, and you know, you actually work for a financial institution and you get to talk to so many more, is, um, you know, I'm sure everybody in the room has heard the uh, acronym of FOMO, uh, F-O-M-O. -O. It's called Fear of Missing Out. And there are a lot of FIs that are, again, can of curious, hemp curious, they're on the sideline and they see this explosive market occurring on either side, it doesn't matter if it's the hemp-based or the marijuana-based, and they see all this cash and this opportunity for low-cost deposit dollars, and the, the lack of regulations or clarity and or the strict guidance from FinCEN, you know, depending on how you look at it, um, there is a lot of FOMO uh, you know, going on out there where people are trying to figure out, can I do this, how do I do it, is this worthwhile, should I, should I jump in? you know, what sort of feedback in, you know, either at an institutional level or at a national level are you all hearing? Well, let's take a of hands. What financial institutions currently have uh, customers that sell him? Okay. We got some people where? Growing. Growing. Okay. So um, I've, I've seen concerns before um, about tipping their toes into the water. Um, and I, I think you just have to be careful and you just have to make your appropriate um, risk. You know, if, we've, if you're going to try to make a loan to a grower, you've got to understand that uh, there's a risk that when they grow the, uh, the hemp, the THC level could go above 0.3%. Uh, if that happens, you've got a hot crop. Well, your hot crop is going to be destroyed. So if you're making a loan based off of the resale of that hemp, exclusively, well, that's a high-risk loan. Um, if you've got an account with somebody doing it, um, you know, who, you know, a Kroger or a Dillard's that sells CBD, it's not going to be as high. If you have a standalone CBD and hemp shop selling all sorts of kinds of things, you know, whether you have an account with them or whether you have loans with them, um, you're going to want to inquire some additional information about what the appropriate risk of this customer is. Yeah, and just to add to that, from a, a sort of a broader national perspective, I've seen uh, and heard a lot of frustration about a lack of guidance from USDA. Uh, as part of the Farm Bill in 2018, I don't believe we've mentioned it yet, but USDA is required to uh, release regulations. Uh, they were sent over to uh, the White House for finalization a couple weeks ago, and we're anticipating uh, end of this month they'll be released. Um, but once they're released, there's still the implementation aspect, and uh, that gets into uh, the commodity insurance and crop insurance as well, and ha how that will be regulated for hemp. So I think there are folks that are, are very interested in getting involved, but the, the uncertainty and the lack of clarity on regulations is just preventing them from doing so at this time. 
And uh, from my opinion, I, I don't see that getting any better, at least in the near future. Do you see the Safe Banking Act in and of itself as they're talking about it now? And there are some carve outs in the, in the, for hemp, particularly, you know, having, you know, a facilitative impact for people earlier than anything that may happen out of the Senate? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, Safe Banking Act is not law. It's only passed the House. And uh, as we've all learned from watching Schoolhouse Rocks or our social studies class over the years, I'm, if, a bill. I'm a bill just sitting on Capitol Hill. It still needs to pass the Senate and uh, be signed by the president. So the president's still kind of a wild card in this situation. He's, uh, for personal reasons, he's, he's opposed to, to various substances, and he's, he's had some family history there. So I, I don't know if he's going to sign the Safe Banking Act into law. Uh, he did sign the 2018 Farm Bill, which had uh, some uh, provisions in there related to hemp, as we've discussed. But this is a broader package. So it, the Safe Banking Act does not do anything in its current form to, to I think, get people off of the sidelines. Yeah, and I think even if it was it passed, it's, it's going to make it a little bit more confusing. Uh, you know, I have to remind people it, it's legal, it's legal, it's legal. Um, and, you know, except for the issue with CBD. And so the most the Safe Banking Act is going to do, at least when it comes to hemp, is to say, no, we really mean it. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, what, you know, the, the right federal regulators, if the Safe Banking Act passed as it currently stands, specific to hemp, it would say, well, we're going to do the best practices when it comes about the hemp. And it's like, okay, well, how, you do, how do you do that? Because you don't even have uh, the, the regulations related to the 2018 um, Farm Bill instituted. And so it would be hard for banking regulators to come up with guidance on top of that. Um, I will, you know, one thing that we haven't raised, so right now the pilot programs are just in places where the states who pass them are at. So Arkansas passed a pilot program and is acting. Oklahoma passed a pilot program and it's acting. Texas did not pass a pilot program. They've passed hemp regulation, but they're waiting on the 2018 guidelines to come through. Once the 2018 guidelines come through, states are going to have to go back to the USDA and say, approve our program again. So Arkansas will have to do it too. So we may have a, a bit of variation in what our current um, regulations are in regards to hemp um, after they, you know, hopefully 2019, they'll actually have regulations related to the 2018 Farm Bill, but we'll see. Okay. I mean, from a personal opinion and, you know, working with uh, lobbyists at the national level, uh, when we look at the Safe Banking Act, uh, I think there's uh, a couple of things. One, you know, the, the, the rule says that you will be allowed to bank. There's not a period at the end of that sentence. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's a comma. And the comma says, provided you follow all the rules and regulations. So Washington cannot help itself. It never has helped itself. This isn't a political statement. It's just we can expect more rules and regulations, you know, coming out of that. And so um, the rules and regulations as they stand today will become a little bit more complex, you know, for the banking industry uh, when that comes out. I think further, too, with the, uh, the scheduling or the descheduling and the classification of, of this, um, Treasury Department really doesn't care what FDA and uh, the uh, USDA says. Um, they're concerned about money and, you know, good money going into the banking system and bad money staying out. Um, so you, this is never just going to be a green light that just says, okay, everybody, you know, go ahead, bank, do what you want, even if you're following the rules and regulations, because, you know, the illicit market in the U.S. is about five to eight times greater than the illicit market, even after this, this, you know, the farm bill came on. And a lot of that has to do with the derivative product. So everybody's heard about uh, vape lung and the vape crisis, et cetera. Um, you know, that's throwing a big, big wrinkle into, you know, how hemp is now possibly going to be banked. So, you know, what do you guys see or hear as it relates to that aspect of the product safety? I mean, for our purposes, we can't really make a determination. We don't know what's going to happen happen with vaping regulation um, it again just goes to your customer and knowing your customer are you doing business with a CBD standalone shop that you know could have um, other issues do you have a CBD shop where you know the owner is also an owner of um, a marijuana 
company. Um, you know, those types of issues are going to have to be analyzed when you say, yeah, we're going to open an account for somebody with a CBD shop um, or extend a loan, et cetera. Um, and so vaping, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, and, um, but uh, you just have to keep in mind if you're going to go forward um, the, the different type of risk uh, that, that can be created with the different type of clientele. Yeah, and to, to sort of echo that, uh, the ABA, for our position, we don't take a stand on the legalization of marijuana. I think the vape issue ultimately is in that realm. Um, from a purely hemp-specific point of view, I think as there are efforts to potentially regulate vape and vape products, um, you'll see enough of a, a reaction from uh, certain senators, representatives, uh, certain committees to, to carve out hemp. I mean, there's a reason why it's been, there was a pilot program in 14, there was further guidance in 18, and now it was included in the Safe Banking Act uh, to sort of get it over the finish line through the House. So I think the vaping issue is a, a, a larger problem uh, related to sort of the, the cannabis conversation as a whole, but from the hemp specific thing, uh, or, specific perspective, I, I don't think it's something we need to worry about. Okay. So, you know, when, you know, as an FI and they're looking at some of these uh, businesses and they have a license, they're a grower, they're recognized, you know, farm or, you know, uh, a hemp-based uh, business, you know, one of the things that, you know, they really need to be able to do is understand what products are, are being sold so that they're, that they're not, you know, mixing money or, you know, and you know, mixing product, et cetera. Um, you know, what do you, what are your thoughts as it relates to you know structuring programs? You know, from an account onboarding, a transaction monitoring, and then ultimately, what sort of reporting requirements? You know, are you anticipating might come out of this? You know, we don't know, right? You know, they're they're crafting this language as we speak, and you know, we're all trying to look through again our crystal ball and understand what the future might look like, but. Do you have any indication of you know where that might go? Well, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. well, I was going to say, you know, I since I don't know what's going to happen, I have to look at what we have right now. And what we have right now is what do you what do you look at a hidden customer when they come online? And I've touched upon several different issues, um, and you just have to say, hey, at what level do we have to raise our um, inspection into the customer um, you know you, you, hemp is not going to be standalone in the fact that you're going to have many people who are doing marijuana business on top of that and um, you know I'll give you an example so for Oklahoma they've got a hemp program they're in the uh, pilot program but as of July the the marijuana laws in Oklahoma are different from Arkansas essentially it, it, it's the Wild West it's only medical marijuana but you know Arkansas you have five cultivators and 32 dispensaries. In Oklahoma, you had, I think, something like 3,500 cultivators and about 1,500 dispensaries. And by the way, you get to grow your own in Oklahoma. More. Uh, more uh, now, more now. Oklahoma, yeah, okay. So when you you get kind of the, the cross-customer um, uh, issue when you take different people on. And, and depending on how you develop your BSA system, and the, uh, the type of due diligence your system can, can check and hit those people who are licensed. Because, I mean, these people get licensed. It's weird to think if it's, if it's drug like any other drug, you don't usually have cocaine dealers registering themselves with the states. Um, and so that information is available. Um, and so when you have a client come in, is your system going to tag and say, oh, yeah, this person also has a marijuana business or they have a, some, you know, a company, et cetera? And so you, you have to think about that on the front end um, because even if you're not doing business with him customers, you, they're going to start coming in and their employees are going to start coming in. And um, it's better to have a plan of action on the front end than be huddling up every single time, you know, BSA sends an uh, you know, alerts you that, oh, this is going, you know, we've had an issue. So um, that's about all you can do is, is deal with uh, the risk that you have in front of you and um, uh, let Dan worry about the future. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with Daniel and uh, what he said on that. And uh, I mean, it's, it's gonna take some time to figure out what USDA does, then 
there's uh, potential uh, AML BSA uh, legislation that might overhaul that program as well, so and change reporting requirements there. So I'd say just have a plan of attack, do your due diligence, and just uh, keep uh, in touch so we can provide you with some updates on when these new regulations will go into effect. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, another common scenario. If, if somebody does come in and say, hey, I, I've got a marijuana business, will you do banking with me? No. Okay, well, I've also got a hemp business, will you do banking with me? Maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll let you do your own analysis, but somebody has come to you and asked you to be participate in um, uh, money services related to a drug. Now, you don't even have to look at the FinCEN guidance uh, to address that issue. Um, you just know somebody, A, has, has come to you asking you to funnel money related to drugs. Well, be in communication with your BSA departments. So I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience can relate to this next statement, and you don't have to raise your hand, but you know, the, the sheer wealth that this, these industries, we'll call them industries, are purporting to you know, generate has a lot of your you know, more valuable long-term clients uh, making investments in, the, in this industry, or maybe even getting into this industry in terms of financing. It could be through a landlord facility, could be through leasing land, it could be you know, they just opened up a dispensary and they're financial backers. So one of the things, and we talked about legacy cash, so this is a kind of a multi-part question. There's no way to untangle this mess, so I apologize if Sometimes the questions themselves seem confusing, but you have long-term account holders that have entered into this industry knowingly, but may not have disclosed that to you know, their, their bank. Uh, the bank finds out. So account retention is actually something that we get a lot of inquiries about. Uh, and then we also brought up legacy cash um, from some of these businesses. So. Again, just from an opinion standpoint, because none of us are lawyers and none of us are, well, one of, one of you guys is a lawyer. I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I'm yeah, we're, we're both attorneys. Yeah. Attorney so, but, um, Dan and Dan at law. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan squared. Dan in stereo. Um, but Daniel and Dan. So, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts as it relates to that? We're not offering legal opinions is what I meant to. Yeah, well, you know, none, of the, none of the opinions <laughs> up here are, uh, are of Simmons Bank or even my own. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I was I, no, confused no, no. by that. I, I, I had to, no, I had to steal that from a, uh, a Federal Reserve uh, uh, economist. It was a pretty good line. But, <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, I, I take the view is of you can't have money from um, an illicit transaction come into the bank. And you, that's my view. And um, I think that's a straightforward view and it will guide you through a lot of different principles in a lot of different scenarios. Yep. Uh, personal opinion, uh, I would exercise restraint. Um, the projections of all of the, the revenue that can be generated in this space, it's a lot of it's based on a limited supply right now, and we don't know where the regs are finally going to go. So if people start growing, if we look at hemp specifically, people start growing more hemp. Well, what happens when you have a huge supply of something? The price is going to go down. There's uh, reports coming out now about tax revenue in states where uh, marijuana is legal. The projections are down. So uh, I would just exercise caution as you move into this process and maybe start dipping in a toe or, or jumping in uh, wholeheartedly. So that's my opinion. And commoditization is as absolutely occurring, you know, as it relates to the price point of, of the products, and it's all the products. You know, it's, you know, certain states that were out there further and, and have a history of running, you know, especially Oregon and Washington, et cetera, on the cannabis side, um, their price points have dropped so dramatically, they're actually pushing really hard to create interstate commerce. And we talked about interstate commerce financially, but there's also the interstate commerce of product, et cetera. So what is going to be legal, what's not going to be legal, and, and how that all gets structured is, is very fascinating. Um, so if you, one of the things that we've learned in talking to financial institutions is that you, you have to be black and white in terms of what your, your, your stance is on these programs. You either have to have a hemp cannabis banking program or you have to say you don't have a hemp cannabis banking program to some of the points that you raised, uh, that you both raised. Um, 
And so at what level do you, uh, do you push that, okay? So there's tier one, we didn't make this up, this is somebody else's definition, and it's stuck in the industry. There's tier one, there's plant touching businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their whole business is derived from something to do with the crop, doesn't matter which one it is. Then there's tier two where, you know, uh, the vast majority of their revenue is derived from supporting those industries. And then there's the tier three people, you know, your utility company, the guy who installed the security cameras, you know, in a dispensary, you know, how do you look at those, those accounts? It's, you know, it's very complicated. So, you know, we'll start down at the, the far end of the table at the national level and then, you know, piggyback on what you said, Daniel, about you can't touch that money. You know, how does that, how do you see that cascading through, you know, the banking system? Um, I think from a policy perspective and, and a place to actually get movement on the issue, the, the tier three and to a lesser extent tier two businesses are really going to be the driving factor uh, in getting uh, any sort of legislative change. Uh, a great example with the Safe Banking Act is Congressman Stivers from Ohio got heavily involved in this issue in large part because of his local tier three, tier two businesses that are cannabis adjacent businesses. So that I think is a, an argument that a lot of members are latching on to now, and, and I think there's a, a chance to, to really uh, push from that perspective. Um, as far as to how you deal with those types of businesses, I'll defer to, to Daniel on that. Um, it, it puts you in a lot of uh, strange scenarios. So if you're in, let's say, Oklahoma, and, and you're in the Wild West again, and um, you've got a customer that uh, you know, maybe has a mortgage with you, has a, uh, an account with you. And then one day they come to you and they say, oh, I'd also like a car loan from you. And by the way, I changed jobs and I work for a dispensary. And 100% of my income that I just told you about is from that dispensary. Well, you've got a banking account with them. You've got a mortgage. Um, what are you going to do? Are you going to terminate that account? Are you going to say, no, we can't take the money on the mortgage? Those are real situations that I can see arising. Um, you know, again, my view is the bank cannot take money from an illicit transaction, um, but know that these issues can arise and, and, you know, have your brain trust with a handsome attorney on it. And, uh, no, that, that joke fell flat. Jeez. <laughs> um, I won't do that one again. On you. Yeah. I, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I felt that one. That hurt. Um, but no, that's, uh, I, I figured the brownies would have kicked in by now, yeah. but I guess not. Those are gummy bears. Watch out. You're up too late. But no, that's, um, it, it's a difficult situation. And, um, you know, as I was telling Dan, we're in this position because, you know, Congress allowed, um, you know, back in 2014, they started saying, DOJ, you do not have the money mm -hmm. to go after marijuana businesses if it's for medical marijuana. And that opened that created the environment where somebody can come to a bank and say, hey, I sell drugs for a living. Can I have a bank account and can I have a loan? And just to, to add to that real quick, from a personal perspective, I think the larger conversation ultimately has to go towards uh, descheduling cannabis. I, I think given with the Cole memo in 2014, which Daniel referenced, it's, it's a year by year thing. It's tied up in the appropriations process right now. And we all know how good Congress is at uh, getting spending bills done on time um, or at all. So I think with that, uh, the larger conversation needs to be had. There needs to be medical research done um, on the effects on some of the potency of THC. And, and I think that's, again, my personal opinion where we're headed because of this uncertainty. Yeah, so descheduling is, uh, is interesting. Um, I live in Connecticut, that's where our company is based, and the gentleman who actually wrote the medical cannabis program in the state of Connecticut, we're known for a lot of things, not a lot of great things, I will say, even though I do live there, but uh, they are recognized as having one of the best defined and best run medical marijuana programs, and the reason being is the guy who wrote it will publicly tell you he never wanted a dispensary to open. but. You know, people are creative and capitalism thrives and survives. And so they actually figured out how to, how to do it and get these uh, accounts open. But one of the things that he did early on, uh, and we see this in a couple of other places too, and you know, it's, a, it's somewhat of a harbinger for what may happen in, in Washington, is he descheduled, um, he was the commissioner of uh, Department of Consumer Protection, which oversees medical marijuana in Connecticut, 
and he changed the schedule to schedule two for cannabis. And Washington called him up and they said, you can't do that. And he said, well, show me where it says I can't. And we did. So what's, what's going to happen? And nothing ever happened. Uh, but what, they did, what that did do is it did put further regulations on it because it put it into the prescription monitoring program which is something that you know, was very important and very much needed because it is a medical program with very strict conditions and it's monitored like any other controlled substance that you would get. Um, so there are, you know, the point of that being that on a state-by-state -state basis, these programs all have their own rules and regulations. So if you are at, at all entertaining, you know, looking at these programs uh, in any detail, I uh, highly encourage you to talk to people that are in the industry. That's not about me. That's not about us. There's a lot of people out there. Um, and talk to your peers in other states. Talk to people that have looked at it, that have done it. There's a lot of uh, what we call uh, cannabis or hemp banking 1.0 people. They jumped in. They thought they could do this. They saw it as a the green rush, you know, as some people have labeled it, from an opportunity. And now they're having to close those accounts. You know, you mentioned Oklahoma. There's, uh, you know, a well-known you know, credit union that jumped in and they're already winding down the entire program because they realized it just didn't work. Um, and one of the other things that we see that's really, really important as you're considering all this is nobody likes surprises, okay? Mm -hmm. Boards don't like surprises. Examiners don't like surprises. Third-party vendors don't like surprises. Talk very openly about what you're going to do, and you're going to get a wide variety of opinions. You know, there are some boards that are just flat out, never going to happen, forget it, conversation over, what else do you have? Um, same thing with the examiners, and same thing with third-party vendors. Could be your corresponding bank or, or others. So you'd really be surprised as to, once you look at it, just how complicated uh, the nuances of that actually can get. So wonder if, you know, have you guys ever talked about it internally? You don't have to disclose and say pass or, you know. Have we ever talked about what internally? You know, just full on hemp banking or cannabis banking programs and, you know, the complexities of if you ever wanted to do it. Oh, I mean, everybody looks at what the complexity is, uh, but, you know, you, you end up on square one that it's against the law and, and that's not changing until it changes. And so that, you know, that ends up being, um, an easy, uh, easy decision. Yeah. Okay. So that's the majority position from what I've heard from most of our membership that has been open enough to talk to me about it. So right now nationally, and you, you all have this access to the same information that anybody else in this room has that, you know, uh, over 500 different financial institutions uh, report that they're banking, you know, this industry today. And, you know, they filed the, uh, the SARS. So your peers and counterparts are out there doing it. I will also tell you, though, if you dig into the details of some of those, on average, 25% of those SARS that are filed are termination SARS. So they either found out they were banking, you know, some of these industries, and they found out because they didn't disclose that when they opened the account. You'd be surprised how many yoga, massage studios, and wellness and plant centers there are that are actually dispensaries or, you know, uh, hemp operations. Uh, but that number continues to creep up. So more and more people are getting involved uh, with the industry. Um, are they doing it properly? Are they doing it effectively? You know, that's, that's for the examiners and, you know, everybody else that's involved with them to, to look at. Can I just jump in real oh, quick? Uh, open mic night. Five, 500, 500 sounds like a big number, but if that's just banks alone, there's over 6,600 banks in the country. So even if it's creeping up, it's still less than 10%. It is, but it, it's been creeping up on an average of 10% uh, every six months. So uh, not too long ago, it was under 300. Now it's over 500. And again, you know, that, you know these are the folks that are filing one of the three types of SARS related to this industry. Um, and you can see, again, 25% are termination SARS. I will say just on this point, it'll be interesting. I think there was a case filed recently in Arkansas that is a, a dispute, disputed contract related to uh, marijuana. My um, opinion has always been a court will kick that out because they're not going to see a case that disputes an illegal substance. 
Um, so if there's any attorneys in the room, uh, that'll be interesting to watch, at least and see how Arkansas courts handle it. Yeah, so we could we could talk about different scenarios, et cetera, but you know, this is a session for you. We've given you a you know good overview of the national and some of the things that are happening here at a state level. Uh, any questions? If you do, if you'll just raise your hand, we have a runner with a microphone to get to you. <laughs> all right, excuse me. Uh, we're all, all friends lock, here. Lock, lock, th lock those doors. Nobody is allowed back. to leave until we get at least one question. There we go. Yeah, do you have any more of the brownies? I think we got some open open spots. Go for it. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the questions we get all the time, and no, we don't. <sighs> Well, I'll take one for the team and go ahead and ask the question. You were talking about how it's a major difference between, of course, the hemp industry and the cannabis industry. But looking at those regulations and the potential laws that they're, that they're considering at the moment, do you see that those will affect whatever legislation in the future comes as far as cannabis is concerned? And if so, how would it affect it? I, I think it will affect it just because the, you know, the concentration of THC in the products and that, that's the thing that everybody is really focusing on now, that 0 .03 limit. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, CBD-based products that have heavy THC concentration. I was just in California last week and you know, as part of, part of our work, we're in dispensaries and it's just amazing, you know, the selection of products that, you know, people actually are out there manufacturing and selling. Um, so, you know, it's going to be really interesting because, you know, as Daniel pointed out, you can go to Kroger's, you can go to Dillard's and, you know, those, that's very hard when you walk into a facility like that or, you know, any of the normal, uh, you know, quick gas stations, et cetera, you see those products. You know, how does that prevent children, you know, minors, you know, people from picking up that product and selling it? It doesn't. And, you know, so I think that that will become a, you know, a very big sticking point. And there's going to be a lot of arm wrestling on that. I also think, again, this isn't a, a political statement, I think the Safe Banking Act is, is going to get stuck. Um, I think it's going to get stuck in the Senate. And when it, even if it does come out of the Senate and goes back to the House, the House, uh, certain members of the House are already talking about certain additional things that they want to put into the bills and you know, different earmarks. and. Mo mostly around uh, the social justice aspect. Uh, I can speak firsthand, you know, knowing in both Connecticut and New Jersey that those two adult bills got, got stopped, crushed, delayed, whatever you want to call it. Uh, again, I'm not taking a position on this because of some of those social equity things that were added into it. And so both sides, both, both the House and the Senate have already started talking about that. And you know, if they're going to come to any sense consensus and conclusion and try to you know put ten pounds of sugar in a five pound bag again with all this, and again, it's Washington. I just think it's going to get get stuck, um, and that will be unfortunate for everybody. I tend to agree with you initially on on where safe is headed, but I think just the with the market with the uh, ballot initiatives across the states, there's going to be more legislative action moving forward. There there has to be. Um, I could foresee again my own personal opinion. I could foresee FDA getting involved on CBD uh, regulation at some point, just because if you go to a local store and you you pick up two different bottles of the exact same CBD oil, one is uh, tar black and the other one's clear. So what's the difference? I mean, I, I think FDA is gonna probably try to enter that space. Um, I, I don't know, uh, a lot of this could change in 2021 as well, depending upon how the outcome of the next election goes. I think some of the social uh, justice or social equity aspects uh, will come into play. Um, not to get too inside the beltway at all with this next statement, but the procedurally, the SAFE Act was brought up under suspension, so those amendments would be kept out. If they go uh, and the, the Senate passes their own version and they go to conference, those amendments could still be kept out. Uh, it's just more than uh, corralling the votes uh, by Speaker Pelosi. So uh, I think there's more legislation coming, whether it's SAFE, some variation of SAFE, or possible regulations by agencies outside of USDA. I, I think it's anybody's guess right now. No more brave souls. 
That's it. <laughs> we, we, we gotta clap. <laughs> guess guess who guess who's not interested in any of this stuff? The young lady who clapped. <laughs> Well, no brave souls. No, we're not. We're, there's no one recording anything in here. All right. Well, y'all, what's that? Yeah, that exact one. Well, that's true. That's true. Well, thank you, uh, Kevin. Appreciate you making your way here.